Um, and I'd like to begin by introducing a very distinguished guest who is joining us, um, Nancy Taylor. Nancy is with the firm Innocente and Webel, landscape architects of Locust Valley, New York, and Hove Sound, Florida, and Spartanburg, South Carolina. Innocente and Webel have been practicing since 1931. The firm has designed landscapes up and down the East Coast, as well as in the Midwest, including the Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia, the Governor's Mansion in Albany, New York, Keeneland Racetrack in Lexington, Kentucky, and many private estates. Ms. Taylor became interested in landscape design in the 1960s, joining the firm in 1968, where she apprenticed for 12 years before receiving her landscape architecture license in New York State in 1980 and Florida in 1990. In her 46-year career, Ms. Taylor has worked on over 300 projects from Maine to Florida. And our great interest in the firm, Innocenti and Webel, has to do with the three designs that you see, one on the easel and two flat um, on the table over here, because um, Electra Webb commissioned the firm to do the initial drawings for Shelburne Museum in the late 1940s. Mm -hmm. Now, we know Electra was a woman of strong opinions. And if you have regarded these drawings for even a brief period of time, you will see that she was um, completely comfortable ignoring the advice of her professional uh, <laughs> partners. Um, but you will see the, the sort of genesis of this constellation of um, gardens and landscape features and buildings which became <coughs> Shelburne Museum um, was really in partnership with the firm. So we'll initially ask Nancy to say just a few words as she joins the, the conversation today and then we are going to open this up and I take my uh, role as moderator for this um, to say almost nothing other than call on you. Um, so Nancy, please, please do okay. say hello. I'm here rep representing Innocenti and Webel, landscape architects. I think Tom pretty much said my introduction, but I'll do it again. Innocenti Webel was formed in 1931 when Alberta Innocenti and Richard K. Webel launched their own firm on Long Island, having worked at Ferruccio Vitale's firm in the 1920s. Dick Webel, after graduating from Harvard Landscape Architectural School, was awarded the Prix de Rome and studied at the American Academy in Rome in 1926. Mr. Enochetti, who knew how to charm the ladies, was a true plantsman. Dick Webel, who also had great charm, felt that structure was the basis of the garden. Between Mr. Enochetti's plant plantsmanship and Mr. Webel's convictions about structure, they made a formidable team. The design style of the firm is pr primarily classical, sometimes modern, always timeless. Our design theory is based on strong visual order combined with living, changing planting to soften the architectural lines. The firm of Innocenti Webb was still going strong with offices in Locust Valley, Hope Sound, and Florida, and land of South Carolina. Our office has completed thousands of jobs, including Belmont Racetrack, the Greenbrier, Blair House, Elizabethan Gardens in North Carolina, as well as restorations of Boscobel in Hudson, New York, and Stanley House at Tryon Palace in New Bern, North Carolina. In 1948, Electra Webb contacted Mr. Innocenti to help her lay out the museum and locate buildings, trees, and roads. Our office has many drawings of the museum and grounds, like these, also on display here at the museum. I believe that the original part of the museum at the bottom of the hill was laid out according to the plan. But after that, although consulting with Innocenti regularly, it appears that Mrs. Webb did her own thing. <laughs> Elector Webb's letters to Mr. Innocenti from the 1950s discuss location of additional buildings after the main part of the museum was complete, including location of the Ticonderoga, the Sawmill, and the Havemeyer building. In fact, as many letters were written, as many plans that were drawn, as much advice that Mr. Innocenti gave, Electra Webb chose to do things her own way. Um, as a tie to Cindy's work at the King's Garden in 1975, Dick Webble had done some plans of parking areas for tourists and buses for Mr. and Mrs. John Pell at Fort Ticonderoga. Preservation of historic gardens is vitally important which this symposium is highlighting. My colleagues on the panel are obviously doing a great job accomplishing just that. Electra Webb, of course, exemplifies true historic preservation 
by creating this treasure of mu museum of, of American treasures. That's it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I might offer the first question. I was um, fascinated. I love this um, phrase, three-dimensional textbook, which, which came up in the, in the last, um, last paper. And so much of um, the papers that we've heard this morning have obviously been landscape architects, garden designers engaging in history and historicism and the past and taking lessons from the past. Um, but how much of this, my, my question for any of you or each of you, is how much of that is meant to be um, prescriptive, or I should say how much of it is meant to sort of model behavior in the present. If we are looking to the past to provide aesthetic uh, choices for these gardens and landscape moving forward, what, what, are we, what are we trying to accomplish by doing that? <laughs> I'll you throw that in the started? middle. I'll say Go something. I think that we can't go forward without looking backwards, but I don't think we should be limited by going backwards. I think that a lot of what we need to learn about and what a lot of what I've learned about simple gardening from what plant survives to good design comes from watching what does survive. And I do believe that we, we preserve the best of what was done. So if we really do think about these landscapes as three-dimensional textbooks, I think we're better to get out of the classroom and outside and really looking and understanding and whether that be a cemetery or an estate or a tiny little cottage garden, then I think there's a lot to be learned that we can take to task and then create new design ideas and new planting concepts and new ideas about both sustainability and being sensitive to the landscape from what we've looked backwards and really looked at and learn those lessons and take them forward in new ways. I would agree with all of those concepts, and I'd like to slightly throw down the gauntlet uh, at the underpinnings of the conference title at large, because I'm still very uneasy with the concept of the colonial revival landscape. It certainly wasn't terminology that was being used in much of the period that we're talking about. And rather than that, this is we're looking at the evolution of an American landscape or American gardening tradition that is informed as had been all the other earlier traditions by a knowledge of what had preceded their creations and a reaction against either borrowing or um, opposing and I think that rather than just seeing the gardens of this generation from the 1890s on to the middle of the 20th century on into the 21st century is somehow a mindless repetition of colonial idioms for an antiquarian American population. I'd let rather see this generation as one that was highly inventive while also respective of what they could learn from past civilizations, including our own. So I'd encourage all of us to be careful about language and not jump too quickly to the label of the colonial revival as a catch-all that is appropriate for everything we're looking at. Well, I could, all right. Maybe I better put that back. Um, I could just say a, a brief word. I think the colonial revival aside, the the, the main, the main in a nutshell, the the problem or the observation is that gardens evolve. And we've all seen over the years restorations, preservations, whatever. And it's turned out that th those that are kind of a paint by number thing, I'm not gonna mention any particular gardens, but um, that's not really the way to go uh, because gardens evolve. I mean, they, they evolve every week, every month. Uh, one family may have a house, another generation comes in and they, they see that they wanna use it a different way and um, it be, be could become an institution after a while and it needs to be redone. So these are very hard decisions, obviously, that preservationists have to remember, but I think the goal shouldn't always be to take one particular thing and decide, okay, we're gonna get the plans out, we're gonna put all the plants in and bingo, it. this is the same garden it was in 1920. Well, I think that, um keeping the, the bones of a, 
historic garden is terribly important because we do need to keep our history. But of course, we can't keep building gardens that take so much maintenance. I mean, Pinehurst too, if anybody's a golfer here, um, the new golf course uh, that we just had the uh, US Open at, has cut back on their watering system so enormously that the, mm. uh, there's only a little bit of fairway in the center. And, um, and I think it, it's a great way to think and, and start as an example for all of us to uh, figure out about sustainability. I pick up on something, Keith, you mentioned uh, early on. And it strikes me that landscape design through its inherent sort of renewable, um, you know, there's just, there's an immediate renewability. There's just, there's an immediate function that we know things will age, things will decay, things will change over time. That brings us to a much richer understanding of the notion of colonial revival. And I, I'm thinking also of Joseph Everett Chandler's wonderful book, The Colonial House. And this was an architect who moved into landscape design by the 1930s. And Chandler never used obviously the category colonial revival. This is a, a retrospective idea that came in the 1960s or 70s. But he always used to refer to things as first period American, second period American, third period American. So federal architecture was third period American. Um, he was never going to call something Georgian because that wasn't American. Um, so it was second period American. But, but there was a kind of a, there was a, and I, I'm not sure if I'm using it correctly, but a prescriptive idea in Chandler's writing. And I wonder, and we see that with architects, do we see that in the landscape? You know, is it, is it meant to um, sort of have a, a social program today if we are working in a historical, historical vein? Are we meant to shape behavior in any way? Is I guess what I'm, or is it merely an appreciation of moments past? I think that was part of the conundrum that I think Cindy was speaking so effectively to, that any time, and, and uh, the point that um, Judith was just making as well, when you're restoring a colonial or any period landscape, do you attempt to mindlessly replicate what you assume to the best of your knowledge actually existed there, or does it have to be played off against what are the social and cultural needs and goals of the current moment and the current organization that is controlling uh, or stewarding that landscape. Landscapes of their very nature, I think, require change over time when changing environmental conditions, which are just as I, I, I as well was struck watching the US Open on television. Fun, really. I thought, what has happened to this golf course? Yeah. And then my wife was paying more attention than yeah. I was and gave me a, a briefing on what had been announced yeah, on television. Yeah, it was quite remarkable. And actually. it suddenly made them all the sense in the world yeah. that this still was Pinehurst too, yeah. but it was Pinehurst too making sense in 2014, yeah. Yeah. rather than somehow trying to reconstruct the conditions mm. of the world that yeah. generated yeah. Pinehurst too at yeah. its, uh, its Just moment. Like it's a, making it look like Augusta, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't <laughs> totally. think we can freeze anything. And <laughs> restoring back to classic moments are mm. still um, desirable, but uh, always sort of dangerous at the same time. You've been doing a lot of that work. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only thing that makes me nervous about the stories that we're telling now about the past is that we're only telling one people's story. I don't think we're being very multi-ethnic about it. And even though we watch Downton Abbey and we watch upstairs, downstairs, and we know that there were maids and gardeners and servants running all over the place, we really don't do a very good job of showing their impact on the land. So I should have been able to tell you the story about Castle Hill from the gardener's perspective and from you know the Italian stonemasons or talk about the Caproni brothers that came and opened their shop in Boston and then had all of those classical statues that Mrs. Crane could just pick, you know, one from each catalog and then bring them on up to Castle Hill and put them out on the LA. And we have not awakened those stories particularly well at all. And yet that's the real craftsman aspect to it. So that's why I was so happy to have the craftsmen that were casting those and, and doing those columns in the afternoon garden. It's much more about the landscape architect and the client. It's much more about the workmanship and the craftsmanship of the people that either built or took care of those places. 
And so we have a long way to go to tell that story. I think we also have a long way to go to be comfortable with the history of New England for all the other new immigrants that have come and washed up on our shore. And the trustees has a whole range of properties and we're still not really comfortable figuring out how to reach the newest arrivals and what those stories mean to them by coming in as new arrivals. So we have a long way to go to tell all of the stories of the past um, in the respectful way and the appropriate way and get it that all of those people really created these things that we were looking at today. Well, one of the reasons we're gathered here is we're just at a moment where the, the individuals who literally constructed Shelburne Museum have passed on. Um, Rick Peters, who's worked here, I think the longest serving employee, um, overlapped with a number of them. Um, but we have wonderful archives and wonderful photographic evidence of Electra Webb, you know, literally standing in front of bulldozers as what was farmland was shaped into this sort of magical landscape um, that we, we know today. Um, we captured a lot of that as oral, you know, history and we have, you know, Rick to talk to and we have the records here. But what we're doing right now is trying to understand the totality um, of that intention in the 1940s and 50s that created Shelburne Museum, how it changed over time, and then as we move into the future, um, should we choose to do something on the grounds in front of us here in the southern campus, you know, what, what, what are our responsibilities to the landscape that was here um, 50 years ago, 60 years ago? So that's, that's really the kind of one of the undergirding moments of this, this conference as well. And it is a story of many hands, as you just said. Um, you know, this is who's digging, who's driving a bulldozer, who's moving a very large tree, um, to say nothing of a covered bridge or a steam vessel. Right. Um. Um, another question that had come up um, beforehand and the co committee was um, allowed to see this uh, a couple of days ago was a question from perhaps somebody in the audience here about the relationship of the designed landscape to the agricultural landscape. And so I'd like to pick up on that because I think it's a very important point. Um, from the perspective of one of the two informants I was discussing, Charles Elliott, uh, he was very sensitive to a whole range of landscape layers that existed there. And one of the most useful statements he made was in a speech to the New York Agricultural Association where he was asked to define what was landscape architecture. And his view was totally holistic. He said it was the attempt by man to manipulate the surface of the earth for the benefit of current populations. And so I think that very, very broad vision that ultimately gets translated into his efforts with the trustees of public reservations and the Boston Metropolitan uh, Planning and Park and Planning Commissions uh, are really what we need to come back to. Um, think globally and act locally, uh, as they say. I might ask, I'm going to ask one more and then we'll, then we'll throw it open, but you said think globally, ask, or think globally, act locally. Um, one very strong theme that came up throughout um, all presentations, and this is something we, we uh, find as a daily challenge, um, is just the effort and energy required uh, to maintaining these landscapes. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, my question is, is there such a thing as a sustainable landscape, sustainable garden? I understand we do the best we can with, you know, the, these new golf courses and zero escaping and other things, but um, it's, it's a pretty profoundly intensive enterprise in Western civilization to maintain, in this case, 42 acres of landscape. But how, how do we, and I understand, you know, Cindy's, Cindy's got the big, <laughs> the big portfolio of this. You know, I think if you want a totally sustainable landscape for Vermont or New Hampshire or Maine, just let it be woods, mm -hmm. because that's what it wants to be anyway. So the most sustainable landscape you can have up here is to just have an en entire woodland and then build things underneath it, I think, to really be able to make it work. But we even know what the storms do to our woods, so I'm not even sure that's totally sustainable. I just came back from California. We were talking a lot about that ethnographic footprint and the idea of wilderness that got created. So in another symposium a couple of years from now, if you want to have a conversation about real wilderness and how you define wilderness versus um, vernacular or people landscapes, I think that um, even we had a speaker from Yosemite that was talking about the impression that Yosemite Valley was wilderness. 
and yet what you're really looking at is the Native American manipulation of that landscape for food and for sustenance. And that, in their own way, is their own version of a sustainable landscape because they're constantly managing it. But it, again, it's a constantly managed landscape. And I think when we talk about sustainability, what I'm discovering when it comes to these historic properties is that you have to have that mindset of what choices do I make in order to leave the lightest footprint on the resources that are available to us with any one of these projects. And obviously, NOMCAG is incredibly maintenance intensive. And we're building out both a volunteer and an educational core that's part of our engagement programming out there so that we can build in stewardship as part of our engagement and have that property be a training ground for gardeners and for volunteers and for interpreters and be part of the community in that sense. But unless we have a really great gardener that is leading that charge, we are going to lose some of that patina that we've spent so much time and money putting back together again. So we have to actively understand and train and teach as part of all of that to be able to make it work. So there's ways to save some money. I'm not sure that you'll ever save all of the labor that's possible to be able to take care of anything. And that's when you have those conversations about decay and managing ruins and slowing the decay process because that's about the only other way to be as sustainable as I can think of in taking care of some of these remarkable places, but highly intensive when it comes to labor and maintenance costs. Well, I, th I think stepping back, stepping back in time a bit, um, I did have a, a, a question about um, how it was either Beatrix Fallon or Ellen Shipman uh, thought about maintenance, but I think what we really have to think think about with the private clients that were that were uh, commissioning gardens for her, they were not thinking about sustainability. Uh, they were thinking about um, uh, an incredible set piece that would outdo their neighbors and their friends and all their garden club ladies. And I think of the two, probably Beatrix Farrand was more sort of tuned in to what we would call today sustainability in her interest in uh, native plants, of the, all the gardens that she designed on Mount Desert Island in Maine. Um, unlike Vermont, the, the key plant there is moss. <laughs> and peop and it's like going out to Seattle or Portland, they sort of laugh at you if you're interested in moss. It's something they can't get rid of. <laughs> but um, it, it's a part of the property in Maine and ferns and a limited palette of um, evergreens. But that was something that Beatrix found was um, willing to work with. And she fought dearly to get people interested in what we what then was called wild plants and today what we call native plants and they have certainly a sustainable property to them that uh, ephemeral flowers especially in Maine um, don't have it's really interesting you know I work with an ecologist at the trustees and we are managing habitat we have landscape units where we're managing habitat so that we're trying to really build out um, areas for grassland birds especially but for other um, habitats as well and so Russ and I have this conversation all the time about the nature culture balance because mm -hmm. in so many cases we've cleared a lot of a pitch pine forest on Martha's Vineyard to create grassland habitat again for the birds that are coming through there on the flyway but it's all people people managed to create that native landscape so that the birds can occupy it again. So it's a really interesting conversation when you start to have conservation and preservation talking to each other and really understand the role of people, whether we're managing native for native plants or we're managing for horticultural plants. It's a, a delicate balance that people end up in no matter what we do. I think that um, uh, uh, um, what am I saying? Um, Preserving historic gardens, I think uh, Cindy's presentation was fantastic because she showed that basically you're saving um, the the bones of the of the garden and the and the structures and not putting back uh, difficult to maintain plantings and and you know roses and flowers and things. So I, I think if you can do that with historic gardens and just kind of keep the bones in intact, uh, it's one way of preserving historic gardens. I, I saw a number of hands. Why don't, why don't we turn it, turn it to the audience? And Karen has the microphone, and I know our, our colleagues at RETN would appreciate if you 
use the microphone. Thank you, Tom, for a great symposium and all the panelists. It's been very thought-provoking. Um, as a Shelburne resident and as a home gardener, um, I love coming here and touring all of the buildings uh, for their small scale. These, these little buildings which we have uh, clustered around on the campus are so instructive for the average homeowner who is looking for a way to perhaps ornament a shed, a garage, a guest house, a lake camp. So we're not talking about Mrs. Choate's place at Nomkeg, <laughs> but we're talking about the small scale, real world application to the average visitor. And uh, Colonial Williamsburg also does a great job at this, and I was down there uh, recently and I had a chance to meet Wesley Green, who is the head gardener down there and has been there with over 30 years. And I would just recommend anybody to go to Colonial Williamsburg. It's a great, uh, great place to visit as well. Um, so I guess I would have a question about heritage landscapes. And my question is to Lucinda. And if you could tell us more about uh, what NOMCAG is doing with teaching about uh, heritage plants. There's a tremendous um, interest uh, among home gardeners in healthy, organic, open pollinated heritage uh, plants, and also what the visitation numbers are at NOMCIG. Um, we'll do the visitation numbers first because I do know those off the top of my head. There's about 15,000 people that go to NOMCAG now in the space of a year. We would like to double that. Mm -hmm. um, the trustees has not been good with its marketing <laughs> and programming about its properties, which is why many of you probably haven't heard of some of the places I talked about today. They're hidden secrets. Um, unfortunately, if we double the number of people that come to NOMCAG, we have to build a parking lot to put all those cars in because we're still operating on Mrs. Choate's parking system, which is very limited, and the vegetable terraces right now are the parking. The interest in heritage plants is a really good one because there was a greenhouse at Nomkeg. So when we talk about this question of sustainability, it was a wooden frame glass greenhouse about the most unsustainable, ungreen kind of a structure you can find. And a lot of our farmers at the trustees put up their hoop houses, which I hate because I don't think they really mimic anything about the vernacular landscape or any of the building forms in New England, but they're cheap, they're easy to put up, they grow the plants that they need for the farms especially, and they don't take a lot to heat them when they do them. So if we put back this greenhouse element at Namkeg, which was a critical part of the experimental garden and the cutting garden and even the vegetable terraces with this um, testing of plants and plant hardiness and new horticultural um, cultivars that, that she was hearing about in her garden club meetings and Fletcher Steele was finding all the time and bringing back to her at Namkeg, um, we have talked about this question of heritage plants and is there a role for us to do new horticultural cultivars in the experimental garden or should we be an incubator for heritage plants? And one of the things at Nomkeg that I didn't show you today is that we have a giant peony garden there, but it's mostly tree peonies. And they were brought back in the 1930s after Mabel Choate went to China and Japan and really loved the plant. And she worked with hybridizers on the east coast of Massachusetts, as well as a hybridizer in Ontario, Canada, who was producing yellow tree peonies, which was a totally over-the-top great horticultural invention back in the 1930s. And we've been tracing those tree peony varieties and trying to find them again, because we've lost some that used to be in the terraces there. And in that conversation, we've talked to Winter Tour. There is a Heritage Tree Peony website now that you can go to to track some of these varieties. But what's happened is that even the University of Michigan, which houses a heritage plant collection of tree peonies as well as other things, as part of their disaster preparedness, they're looking for other sites in other places to grow on some of these heritage collections because if there's a natural disaster in Michigan and they lose their whole plant collection, they want to be able to go back to somebody else in another you know, state and say, please give us cuttings back you know, of the things that we had because we want to be able to keep the DNA and we want to be able to keep the genetic strains and these particular plants. So we're wondering whether NOMCAG has a role in some of that and do we actually look at new cultivars or do we go back and really um, you know, help with this, um, this bank of heritage plants and, and grow some of those on in some of those spaces and use those as part of our education and 
learning tool, and it allows us to build partnerships with other institutions, with other gardens, and with other horticultural collectors. So it turns out the garden at Winter Tour was done at the same time, and Henry DuPont and, and Mabel Choate were friends. So they've got some of our peonies, and we've got some that they would like. So even among museums and historic sites, there could be a sharing of horticultural information and heritage plants. Um, and it's a, it's a thing that started back in the mid-70s, right after the bicentennial, there was a lot of interest in heritage plants. It's grown now to include a lot of these open pollinated plants because of all of the genetic work that's been done, even on our vegetable crops. And it's starting to show up in conversations about our agricultural crops, but it also should show up in our conversations about our horticultural collections and trying to understand and preserve some of these um, heritage plants before they're lost is what the Seed Savers Exchange was all about. And that conversation seems to ebb and flow depending on the generation and what the focus of any interest is. But, um, but we are talking about whether we can play a role in that. We just inherited the Haskell Nursery and Greenhouse down in New Bedford. And if any of you know Alan Haskell, he was this well-renowned mm -hmm. horticulturist that went over the top, especially with topiary you know, standard plants. Well, we've got um, 11 hoop houses and four standard greenhouses down there, and it's in the middle of New Bedford. So the question for us is, is there a horticultural therapy program? Is there a heritage plant program? Is there some horticulture-based programming that will make it engaging for us to revitalize those greenhouses, build out another kind of a nursery program for our internal use as well as for external use that can build out a great place in the middle of New Bedford that's good for the community but also good for um, the world in a sense, you know, either in the plant material that's produced or the ability that we have to really take advantage of that great legacy and that great facility there and have it pump out something really meaningful. Um, so we're having all kinds of conversations about that, including the role of children at the Haskell Nursery. So it's, um, it's a good, great food for another conversation at another conference. I, I actually had a little footnote, a little historic footnote I can add to that way back over 100 years ago in 1913 uh, when Beatrix Farron started working uh, at Princeton University as a consultant. The very first thing that she did when she stepped on the property was to establish a greenhouse and for, for growing uh, plants for the campus. And then from that, she gained commissions at Yale and University of Chicago, Occidental College. And what she did was develop this system so that each of the, prop, each of the universities that she worked in, she established a greenhouse so that all of, the, all of the different universities could talk among themselves and swap plants. For the University of Chicago, she had all her plants grown at the Morton Arboretum. So the Morton Arboretum would, would ship material to Princeton, and Princeton could ship material out to Occidental College. So she was a little bit ahead of her time there. There was another question off in the... This question may be primarily for Judith Tankard, but I wonder what you can tell us about Ellen Shipman's design for Brickhouse Garden. Brickhouse, of course, as most of you know, is the residence of um, Electra Have Meyer Webb, the uh, founder of Shelburne Museum, and it's about two miles from here. The house itself is considered a colonial revival structure, the core having been built in about 1847 and additions in three increments taking place over the, I think, the second uh, decade of the 20th century. But well, anyway, that, that's a very good question. I'm not quite sure that I can answer it to the depth that you might like to have, and I suspect that maybe some people at Shelburne might have better answers. Um, having looked at the blueprints that she, that she prepared in 1919, um, uh, I can't remember I have a feeling that this was a proposed job and it was never installed. Is that correct? Or does anyone know? Because I was going to say, the, the first step to a consultation would have been uh, obviously a talk with her client. The second uh, step would have been to prepare an overall proposal or a plan like I showed you in my lecture. And it was only really when the garden was under construction or about to be under construction 
that she then prepared blueprints. And what I'm seeing over there are blueprints only. And I'm wondering if the archives here have any more original earlier um, uh, documents to show or give some history about, about the project. The other thing I could say is that they're dated 1919, which was one of the busiest years of her life. Uh, she was in top form. She was designing, you know, dozens of gardens simultaneously. She was also moving her, um, she was moving her office from Cornish, New Hampshire, uh, to New York City. I believe it was 1919 when she um, had her uh, property on Beekman Place built. So, and that's basically all I know about the project. So I'd be glad to learn more about it if there's somebody from Shelburne who who, who could um, fill us in. The the archives are often silent on the relationship between um, ElectroWeb and these professional uh, relationships like in Achenti and Webel and Shipman. But what we do see is um, there is a large body of photographs of ElectroWeb with work going on around her, either posed or other. And so the, the hands-on nature of her relationship with this museum and Brick House is not to be underestimated. Um, <laughs> And um, I'm actually surprised by the photographic record, and I think Rick probably understands the, the echoes of this from his, his working for the family in a later generation as well. But um, she was quite, quite sure of her eye and quite willing to um, direct the bulldozer. Well, I think Ellen Shipman had her share of uh, clients who fell into that category. And, you know, <laughs> based on your comments a moment ago, uh, Electro was a uh, a personality in herself, and uh, Alan Shipman ran into that problem a number of times, and that I think, in some ways, explains why she had what we say 600 commissions, and some of them were pieces of advice, and sometimes she just prepared a plan, and then the client just went with it, and she wasn't uh, part of the installation process at all, which may possibly be an explanation for here. Well, thank you. I did see a question over to the to the west here. Hi, um, this is really for Lucinda. I have had the pleasure of, of spending time at Castle Hill, and so I think it's one of the. It's just a really cool place. Um, can you tell us a little bit about from when you started the restoration and the broadening of the greens and, and how long that took? And then also just a comment to say that when I was there, I thoroughly enjoyed the, the restoration of seeing it in its glory days and could stand there and close my eyes and pretend that I was really there during that time. But then also to look off to the left at, um, I think it was the Rose Garden area, that is really kind of the bones of it, also had this very spiritual feeling. So it was knowing now the history that you've shared, which I really didn't know when I was there or what you were doing. Um, it's, it, what a great feeling to see it now and be able to experience it as it was then, but then also to be able to reflect on how things really do age, but to still be able to enjoy what it was. I don't think you had a chance to see the bowling green, which is right next to the house and is in really bad shape, or the leak in the roof that <laughs> definitely needs to be fixed because it's, it's bothered the, the ceiling on the second floor. Um, I started working as a consultant to the trustees at Castle Hill in 1992. And at that point, they had been doing a lot of thinking. So Castle Hill has had a number of different management plans for how it was going to cope and meet its budget. Um, one of them was this partnership with the Castle Hill Foundation, which is a great history to tell in and of itself because it was an arts and music partner that was basically offering some really great music, jazz music, Louis Armstrong music in Massachusetts, on the North Shore of Massachusetts, you know, in the 1950s when, um, and we've got these images of women all dressed up with their hats on and everything else and their painting easels, and Louis Armstrong is standing right at the top of the Grand Allee with his trumpet, and he's the subject of their painting class that afternoon. <laughs> so there's, you know, both good and bad stories to tell when you talk about this sort of multi-history story of, of any one of our places. Um, 
but the, the landscape itself, so the, the partnership when the dressage horses were doing a dressage show in that formal garden that I showed you where the big flower borders were in the Italian garden, I think that they decided that maybe there was more, the marriage between you know, that partner and the care of the property wasn't necessarily really compatible and the arts and music program wasn't making enough money to help to keep the roof on the house which is what it was supposed to be doing. So, um, so that marriage dissolved, but that doesn't mean that a lot of those supporters aren't still there and they still stayed very involved with the trustees as an organization. And they've been our biggest advisors when we talk about a new arts and music program at Castle Hill because they've already been there and done that. So we're learning from uh, their, all their lessons to have. So the first blush of a formal preservation process started in 1992, and that was with this idea of doing a cultural landscape report. And the reason the report was written was because they were gonna take down all of the outbuildings. There was not enough money. They wanted to basically keep the house and tear down. There was 12 different outbuildings, the chauffeur's house, the barns, um, you know, the casino buildings, and they all represented huge dollars that they, the trustees just didn't think that they could possibly afford. And so they wanted to quicken the decay process and just get rid of them so that they could put them out of their misery and be done with it. And Keith actually served as an advisor as part of the, the process of writing the cultural landscape report to really try to see whether there was a way that we could advocate for the care of these buildings. Well, what happened was for the first time, everybody that had been involved at Castle Hill for so long that had their heads down like this, sort of looked up and said, well, the, the, what the Cultural Landscape Report did was it said, here is Castle Hill. It's this huge landscape with all of these elements inside of it. It's not a house with a front door, and you go in the front door and you experience the house, and then you leave the house and you get in your car, and the rest of it is just setting all around you. It's that whole place that really makes that property what it is. So if the Cultural Landscape Report did nothing else but make that point to those volunteers that were caring for that property, it was a huge success. And it did document those changes of people coming and going. And there's five, you know, um, there was three architects, five landscape architects and, and important horticulturists that worked there. And we have this whole rich story. But it was really that concept of an entire property with a lot of great resources in it that made the difference. And then it was trying to figure out where do you start and how do you move forward. And honestly, it was a donor that came in and said, I like this piece, I want to make a difference. We had a lot of charrettes, so we involved a lot of people in that conversation around where the priorities were and what we started with. And the maze, there was a maze at Castle Hill too, and that's, that got top billing because they felt that was the most interactive piece of the landscape that could be restored. But in the end, there was a bad storm that came along and started to fell the trees on the LA, and that was what spurred the conversation to shift from a fun, cool thing over here to, oh no, this really is a critical landscape element. We care a lot about this, so here's where we really need to start. And it was Mother Nature that was telling us that we had to start. And I can tell you that when we did the first removal on that first phase of the LA project starting in 2000, I've lost track of time now, 2014. So it was 2010 when we began the process in February. We did it in the wintertime so we wouldn't impact all the grounds. Um, we took down all the trees a microburst came through literally two days after we took the first round of trees down and took down a whole bunch more on the property. So <laughs> even though we had this plan all worked out, mm. all of a sudden all these other trees had fallen mm. down around our ears and all the crew had to focus on taking care of all of those before we could go back to the actual <coughs> planting and the programming that we had planned to do that year. So it was good timing mm. and if nothing else, the, micro, the microburst showed everybody else who was a doubting Thomas about this project that yes, in fact, if we don't do it ourselves, they're all gonna come down anyway. And it took down most of the trees in the second phase of the, the project, so we had a much smaller bill in the second year And when it came to the tree removals. I was going to ask what it did for the budget. Yeah, it was great. It was really great. And we got some disaster relief money to help pay for some of the tree removals, so that was also a good thing. So sometimes storms are a good opportunity all the way around. We also recycled all of the materials that we took out of there, so part of the sustainability plan was to chop up all of the, the, um, the tree debris and take it off to a plant that was a composting facility that was right there in Ipswich, have it processed and some of it was brought back and used as the compost that was used to plant all the new mm. trees. Um, any wood that could be saved was processed through. The rest went to a biofuels plant. So we really did try to look at the bigger picture there all the way around. But you know, it's been since 1992 to now is what, 12 years? 
And so we've done that one project <laughs> in that time. And when we started, I, for all the projects I've ever worked on, you at least have to look at a 10-year cycle because first you have to research, then you have to plan, then you have to raise the money, then you have to start to put it in. And then you know it's a process that just takes a long time. But in the scope of these properties, if you're talking about 100 years, 10 years doesn't look like very much time when you're said and done. So you just have to change your perceptions in time and in planning and in the process and be patient. And it really does start to come together after a while. I'd like to thank all of you, <clears throat> particularly Mr. Morgan. I agree with you about the colonial revival really doesn't describe what we're talking about. And my question is, what has come now? I mean, are, are, is there something in gardening that we call uh, contemporary or abstract or what have you? <laughs> in terms of, of current conditions? Yes. Well, we have, haven't, we haven't talked about modernism, which is sort of the uh, anathema term to the colonial revival as a concept, which of course has a very rich and important tradition that is understudied, but has more recently been paying attention to that. And then I think you get into other phases that begin to focus on ecology and sustainability. And there's an agenda that happens with each change of generation that determines how we should be interacting with using and preserving the landscape that we've inherited. So I, I think that those, those series of changes uh, are as dramatic as the design ideals of this sort of golden age of American private landscape architecture from the 1890s to the uh, 1930s. Well, Karen heads east. Um, I'll speak up for the colonial revival for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, I taught Tom about the colonial revival. Now once gone. upon a time, Keith said it was a great idea to study the colonial revival. See, I changed too. I don't know what happened. Well, and I think I did too. I, I, I spent yesterday with our board um, making the case that Shelburne Museum is not an example of historic preservation, but magical realism. Um, which was a term that had great use in the 1940s, just at the same time we started recognizing the colonial revival, um, because I see that we are different from the historical recreations at Colonial Williamsburg or the archaeologically correct historical villages of Sturbridge Village or um, Plymouth Plantation. And in fact, Electra Webb had a very different uh, mandate and idea in mind in the mm -hmm. 1940s and 50s when she created um, Shelburne Museum. But the um, the rubric of colonial revival, which is sort of, you know, it, somewhere along the lines, it got capitalized, capital C, capital M, it became a movement or a period. Um, it is an uncomfortable category for our purposes because it, it takes in so many different styles and types. You need to be more specific um, about, you know, building type or garden type within that. But the entire uh, sort of the, the sort of the rubric or the category does have great use because I think it does provide the foil to what Keith just mentioned you know, capital M modernism, modern garden design from the 1950s and 60s. Um, and I guess my point always is, and it was that early question that, you know, Shelburne and Williamsburg provide such good examples for domestic um, projects at home, which I always point out that, you know, I guess we could look at corporate parks, you know, early Connecticut General in Connecticut where you have, you know, modernist landscape design in the 1950s, but fundamentally this country um, hues to a colonial revival aesthetic when it comes to architecture and the landscape. Relatively few of us live in houses with butterfly roofs or flat roofs. We live in houses with gable. And so as I like to say, if, if we were, when I used to teach undergrads, when, when, you, when you sort of did the game of you know, modernism versus anti-modernism or colonial revival versus the ranch house, the colonial revival won. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> And, and mea, mea culpa, because boy was I a big advocate um, for this. No, this building, um, all right, you had to start. This, this building has a very interesting DNA, the Shelburne Museum, and boy did I hear about it, um, you know, wanted a contemporary center for uh, educational purposes and exhibition, and so we were, um, the, the two options were, 
do we build a barn um, or do we build a contemporary building? Um, and uh, I had wonderful arguments with our newest trustee, Brooks, in the back about uh, this, this concept some, some time back. Um, but I would point out the DNA of this building, the design of this building in the materials and the scale is all extremely contextual um, to this property. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there's a little bit of colonial revival in this building. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Liz. <laughs> um, I wanted to pick up um, sort of from the, the question that the lady just asked about if there's a contemporary style. Um, I'm hearing so much in the conversation, particularly from, from Cindy, how once private gardens, which were meant just for guests, your friends to come in and, and experience, are now being turned into public spaces. And I, I'm, I'm wondering sort of what is the future of the garden? Um, um, another lady mentioned that, that she goes to places like this or to, to Nomkeg, whatever, and takes elements home and, and puts them in her own garden. But uh, I'm just wondering, and, and we talked about, of course, the lack of water um, that, and, and the need for sustainability. Um, I'm just wondering sort of what, the, what you see as the future of, of, the, of perhaps the, the, the private garden versus places perhaps like Shelburne or Nomkeg, um, which will become, in a sense, the, the private garden for the public, if you, if you see what I'm saying. I'm sorry, maybe that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, it's really interesting because I'm about to head to England the end of this summer, and we're talking about the role of some of those country houses in England and how they really have become public parks for the communities around them. And I think the role of some of these larger private-turned-public spaces, including, you know, small parks or rural cemeteries or even the little churchyards, a lot of it is going to depend on the affordability of our long-term housing and really whether people can afford to own land anymore or whether they'll be living in little tiny spaces because if you live in 325 square feet, which many of our children may want to live in near an urban center or even in some of these villages, if it's purely for sustainability reasons or economic reasons, who knows where that's headed. But that makes some of these places that much more important because they become your backyard. Um, we're just going to open the Governor Ames um, property. It's a reservation in Easton, Massachusetts, which is really well known for its mm. Richardson and Olmstead buildings and landscapes and the role of the Ames family in the plow in building shovels and then turning this community into a whole manufacturing center with some big estates all around it. Well, the reason that we acquired that property and the reason it was so attractive to the trustees was because they're renovating all of the plow manufacturing buildings into a f mixed housing. And they're all condos, essentially, or apartments, and there'll be multi-levels of, um, of economics within all those buildings. Well, there's no yards except the little public spaces around those industrial buildings. And so this property sits at the doorstep of all of that industrial building. And as that becomes residential, this um, Governor Ames estate is everybody's backyard and is their own garden and there are garden spaces there and we've talked about the role of community gardening on that property because it becomes their backyard. So I think the more densely we populate our urban centers or our village centers, the more important these public spaces become, just like the town common or the churchyard became for you know colonial um, residents that were living in and around those little centers and then had more land elsewhere you know, to be able to grow all of their food. Um, I do think that they're going to become that much more important, and I think they're going to become more meaningful on a personal level, um, not from a purely historic or preservation level um, in the kinds of relationship people have with those lands um, just because they are right there in their, their own backyard. If everybody in the econ economics change in this country and people can afford to buy a house and have some land around it, then they may not become as critical and as important, but I'm not sure where we're headed, and I think the economics of life is going to determine a lot about what the value of these places are for the future. I'd even add to that the whole issue of sustainability in green roofs and how that's creating a whole other zone of landscapes in urban environments that are previously unknown and will be important for experimentation in the future, as we need that in terms of water retention and runoff issues as well as cooling the temperatures in those buildings and the possibility of opening up
as public spaces and as food generation spaces as well. So uh, the problems that we're confronting in terms of a rap rapidly changing um, universe are ones that are going to produce new generations and ideas of landscapes that even historic properties that feel like museums need to be thinking about how they relate to the changing demographic, the changing conditions of their world at any particular moment. This, this building is intended to be an incubator for ideas for this community. And I, I'm really touched that you brought up you know, water and then earlier wilderness, because in fact, we have exhibitions in development, which you'll see in the next couple of years, one on the concept of wilderness and the other on the issue of water. Um, and these are you know, projects that will be interdisciplinary and plumb these questions through the fine arts, but also take those questions out into the landscape. Um, we are currently developing an exhibition um, with the Vermont Land Trust where we've married up contemporary artists with um, parcels of land in stewardship. Um, and so all of these issues sort of come up for how, how one looks after this land, how one keeps a sustainable landscape um, in Vermont. And this is something that is a uh, sort of particular and paramount interest to Vermonters, it seems. So very, very important. So well here, so yeah. you're going to be a model for the rest of the country. This has been great. Um, I, maybe I left the room for a while. Maybe somebody has already asked this question, but um, I don't understand why people don't grow flowers and vegetables together. Sometimes I have to decide, am I going to water my vegetable garden or my flower well, I garden? Because I, 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 I can't hear the question. Hear I'm sorry. I was just wondering, is anybody considering having a vegetable and a flower garden at the same time. Sure. Yeah. I did one yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. It's great. Okay. <laughs> Flowers and veggies together, yes. And, uh, and our office is trying to work on uh, more sustainable gardens as well, things that are uh, more native plants that don't require as much water. So we have to go in that direction now. I think also the role of the, um, being a landscape architect has e evolved um, in a, at an amazing pace over the last hundred years. I mean, the profession really wasn't developed. I mean, we can talk about Thomas Jefferson, but I, the profession wasn't really developed until um, the late 1890s with Eliot and the rest of them. And then we have this whole subgroup of the women designing gardens and then Beatrix Farrand, of course, stepping over the line a little bit with some of the male landscape architects must have been unhappy, where she's doing uh, university work, botanical work, and going over the line of garden design. And now we she look does, Could you at, dwell on that again for a minute? Because it, right. it really struck me the gender issue was very strong. It's a gender issue. But uh, we look at landscape architecture today, and they were the, the plant element has drop down pretty far in, in terms of relevance and the, the, the old idea from the 1910s and 20s to, make, to design a beautiful garden filled with plants that seemed to magically uh, all be in bloom at the same time forever. Um, that whole concept has completely changed and we can see that in the proliferation of the schools of landscape architecture and what they're learning and um, the the, the way the, the role of, of, of a landscape architect has completely changed and evolved. So I, maybe this might be directed to Cindy. Um, you know, when I, I'm sort of a professional person who doesn't have much time, but I try to have my garden in my yard, and I love that. It's kind of my therapy. But I, I think most people in our busy society honestly don't really care about landscape. They don't think about it. They're running around with their smartphones and they're absorbed in their busy lives. And I think with what you're doing, there's a great opportunity to, uh, in, to raise the awareness. Um, and I wonder if that's something, is there sort of a marketing plan for bringing what you all have shared with us today to average people? Um, and, and the urbanization, I think, is a real problem, too. In Vermont, this is not such a big issue because we're more in tune to the land and such. But I just wonder what your thoughts are about that. You mentioned multicultural. Um, how do you think about that? 
You know, one of my favorite things lately on Facebook is I got a, a posting, and I didn't even know I was friends with this person, but it was their <laughs> pot on their deck. And it was this gorgeous Mexican painted pot full of annuals. And it was two pots on a deck. That was it. That was their garden. But it was, it was important enough to put it on Facebook. And I was glad that I saw this person from my childhood, you know, that all of a sudden I was connected with somehow. And I still didn't understand how Facebook works, so I didn't know how they ended up on my phone. But, <laughs> but, um, it's but a little truly, scary, actually. Yeah, it really is. All of a sudden, there she was. But those pots represented, you know, her gardening, you know, in that little scale. And I don't care how much or how little money you have, if there's that little kernel of passion for putting a seed in some dirt and seeing what happens, then even at that scale, it's really important. And if I had a chance to create a whole line of pots, you know, with some seeds that you would plant, that you could create something, you know, that had heritage plants in it or great looking vegetables or, you know, the newest varieties and cultivars that are out there, it would be a great opportunity as a little tool, like that little bean that everybody planted in the paper cup when you were in kindergarten, mm -hmm. um, you know, to really just incubate some of those little pieces. Um, my kids are all 20 somethings and, you know, one of the likes to sort of be outside a little bit but could care less about gardening. The other one has just settled down with a girlfriend and he's planting, you know, I gave them vegetable seeds. Well, all of a sudden the vegetable shoots are showing up in their cinder block wall, you know, and they're living in downtown Portland. So they've got a little teeny tiny patch of grass and they're asking all these questions about gardening. So I do think because of the local food movement and all the foodies, they're much more interested in where food comes from. And so they're going to the farmer's market. And then the next step beyond that is, well, maybe I can grow my own lettuce. And so I do think that there's an interest. I think there's a lack of understanding and of the talent of making it grow. And my advice to Amanda was, just stick it in the ground, and if it dies, it's okay. Because <laughs> you have to be able to learn, you know, that plants will not make it or they will make it, and the ones that make it are the ones you're really happy about, and you know that you've all of a sudden gardened because you've let something grow and it's turned into something pretty or something useful and it's workable. So I do think we have to get to that basic level, too. And in some senses, you know, when I was working as a consultant at the National Trust at Philip Johnson's house, the glass house down in Connecticut, he called the landscape his expensive wallpaper, and he saw it, you know, outside of those glass walls of that house all the time but I love that term because even if you get in the car like I do and you're driving you know for centuries it seems on the highway um, you end up looking at the landscape all around you all the time and so if we can go from that little pot on somebody's deck to that bigger vision of New England as a cradle of landscape that you you do care about because there are certain views that you love or there's places you like to go on the weekend that is all part of that landscape ethos that I think is really important but I would love to be able to somehow make gardening super friendly and easy and fun and really get people interested even if it's coming to volunteer at some of our gardens Longwood Gardens does a great job with this whole program mm. and I know that Leonard Perry's been doing some of that at the University of Vermont here too with trying to get people excited about gardening the extension service has come back it's got a whole renaissance now with everybody learning how to can vegetables again I never thought in my lifetime I'd see that happen again and here they are so um, so I agree with you I think we really need to instill it again in any way that you can think of as a busy professional that you would like to hear about it we're willing to listen and really willing to make something happen and I'm sure even at, here at Shelburne that's a really good conversation to have here too Let's take one more. Um, I was just wondering um, if you could comment on the High Line, because I live in New York City, and the High Line that we all thought was um, a, a very beautifully designed uh, restoration of an industrial piece of land, all of a sudden has turned into the most extraordinary garden. I think there must be hundreds of plants in it. It looks to me as though they're all uh, very natural plants because I do not see flocks of gardeners weeding them. Um, and I just wondered if you've been to see it and, and if you could comment about that in terms of a modern garden for people. Uh, I'll just take that uh, for a moment in that I've relatively recently had the great pleasure of visiting the High Line in New York City. And if you haven't yeah. been there yet, you need to go because it's one of the great landscape destinations of the moment, I would say. The day I was there, I did see some gardeners at work. So there is a level of maintenance that's involved with it. Uh, but on the other hand, it hadn't been planted as a particularly fussy uh, landscape palette. No, so I don't know no. that it requires no. an intensive uh, amount of maintenance, but maintenance, maintenance okay. is certainly part of it. I think it's the uniqueness of that experience of a linear landscape on top of an industrial roadbed moving in and out closely 
with a whole range of buildings to not only give us an exciting urban experience, but has also changed the surrounding neighborhoods because of this asset, as parks have for generations been great attractors of um, important real estate development uh, around them. Uh, recently, relatively recently, in the last couple decades in Boston, we took down a major highway through the center of the city and put it underground and then have created a surface um, system of parks called the Rose Kennedy Greenway, which when we look at them in comparison with what the High Line is in New York City, we almost wish a part of the old super highway uh -huh. was still in place <laughs> to have been used as creatively as has been the case in New York. And if you talk with contemporary programs in landscape architecture, one of the buzzwords of the moment is landscape urbanism and the sense yeah. of the landscape community coming into its own again of not being the parsley on the platter second thought kind of in, uh, profession, but rather dynamically engaging new opportunities in the urban and larger uh, world. Well, I would like to um, bring the, this formal part of our gathering to a close. Um, I would like to thank Keith and Cindy and Judith and Nancy so very much um, for coming to Vermont and Shelburne Museum. I would like to thank our extraordinary staff at Shelburne Museum, Karen and Rick and Jess and everyone else who made um, this day possible. One of the um, wonderful aspects of um, this symposium today is each of our speakers is indeed a very uh, well-renowned, well-known author. Um, so we have a book signing now, um, and I, I noticed people were grabbing the books all day long, so we might, we might have a rush on books out there, but I, I know the, um, the speakers will step outside for a few minutes and sign, sign those volumes for you. Um, and so you have something to bring home from this, um, this gathering. And then at 4 o'clock, um, Rick and Jess, I believe, are going to take anyone um, who hasn't been on the tours this morning or at lunch um, on a uh, familiarization tour of Shelburne Museum. Um, but again, um, it's my great, great uh, pleasure, um, again, to thank you all for coming and spending the day with us, a beautiful day. Um, I would make a strong plea, please fill out the evaluation forms that are in your Excellent, and we are happy to collect them. Um, this is how we know um, how to uh, move forward with these programs, but I think the uh, obvious success of this day and the quality of the speakers and the presentations um, guarantees we will do this again and again. So on behalf of the staff and the board and everyone at Shelburne Museum, thank you to the speakers and thank you to everyone who, for participating today. Thank you. <laughs>